just say it's a real privilege to be here uh, with a group of uh, such wonderful people. Uh, why, why bother innovating uh, to make a difference, to make people's lives better? So just not just the speakers, but anyone who chooses to be here by choice is actually someone who must be wanting to make a difference and makes, make people's lives better. So I salute you all for that. But one of the questions that when Tanya talked to me about this uh, topic, and I've spent my whole life in the area of telecommunications actually, it's been the major industry I've worked in. I worked on the deregulation of Telstra 25 years ago and have been involved ever since. And I feel very connected to this idea of super connectivity is, well, why? Is it going to make any difference? Is it going to make our lives any happier? Is it going to make us more fulfilled? That's a very good question. Right? You hear all these people talk about Facebook, is Facebook good for our kids or not, and what it does to the brain, and you know, all those sorts of things. Well, I, I, I uh, just like to start with a story. When I, was, when I was 17, I had one of those funny moments uh, that you get every now and again when someone says something and it sticks with you for the rest of your life, and they don't even know. Have you ever had that experience? Well, I, I was 17, I was sitting on the veranda of my parents' home and uh, in the outback of Western Australia and there was a 50-year-old friend of my father's who was a very successful man, as it turns out, and he sat there and he said these words. He said, you know what, I'm 50, I think I've done the thing right, but I'm not sure I've done the right thing. <laughs> and it just struck me that he was a man who I, I viewed as very successful, who was saying effectively, look, I'm 50, I think I did what I did really well, but I'm not sure I lived the right life. What's, what is the right life? And right there in that moment, I, I was sort of, it struck me that what if I get to 50 and I have led the wrong life? I've done it really well, but I've led the wrong life. And I promised myself, I went to bed that night and I sat there and I promised myself that I would have two journeys on my life. The first one would be to actually, whatever I do, I'd do it really well. And the second one would be to, to do the right thing, to live a great life. So I went on a journey to discover what is, what, what is a great life. And then when I was 30, that journey was accelerated because I had cancer and nearly died. And I came down to Melbourne, actually worked with Ian Gawler, who some of you may know, and uh, essentially went on a, on a deep journey of personal discovery and realised that it's only when you really face your death that you learn to live. But what is a great life and what is a healthy life? And uh, so ever since then, I've been reading everything I can get my hands on. I, I, I look at all the research on health and on, on positive psychology, and it's my work in McKinsey. It's what, it's what I do. I look at how you create these sort of environments, and so it's been both a personal passion as well as I've made it my work. And I'm, I'm happy to say that it, it's really uh, coming down to just three or four things, all this, all this research. Uh, and in a sense, it's sort of the meaning of life is, is starting to, at one level, coalesce and it's coalescing around three or four things so let me first of all get money out of the way does money matter to happiness and well-being what do you think the research is very compelling up to five thousand us dollars per year it matters a lot that happiness goes up very significantly and well-being goes up very significantly up to about us five thousand dollars a year which is survival level after that it doesn't make any difference whatsoever to happiness. Uh, it makes different to health outcomes. If you're very wealthy, you can afford better health outcomes. But in terms of happiness, there's zero correlation above US 5,000 between happiness and, uh, and wealth, which is actually quite freeing, actually. We all worry about it. But actually, when you realize that, and when I ever get worried about it, and I, I, you know, I, I earn a lot, and I sometimes still get worried about it every now and again. I always remember, I think back to when I was a student, and I was so poor. But do you, do you remember that? Some of you probably are students and still very poor, but most of you probably aren't. Do you, do you remember? Were, were you any less happy? They were great days. <laughs> they were great days, right? They were wonderful days. Not all the worry of kids and all that sort of mortgages and blah, blah, blah. So there is something there. But once you get that out of the way, there, there are really only, only three things that matter. Right? The first one is what they, what they call uh, having a sort of adequate challenge. Adequate challenge is where you're, you're doing something that's not overwhelmingly challenging such that you feel overwhelmed and it's not so underwhelmingly challenging that you feel bored. You actually feel, and they call it in the literature, you're in flow. Right? And uh, that's actually quite important as it turns out to, to happiness. The, the second one, really important happiness and health, is relationship. Incredible all the research on the impact of relationship on happiness and health. And there's two aspects to that. One is community. That it's, it's Maslow's belonging. If you feel like you belong in a community, 
your level of, of happiness and well-being is much higher. And that's why the work that Tanya and the choirs do is just so incredible. Tanya, when you do the studies of that, you should look at the health effects on that as well. Because the health effects, according to the research, are quite significant of feeling like you belong in, in a community. Right? And of course, this is where super connectivity comes in. This is where social media comes in. What is social media? Why is Facebook so successful? Why has it just gone crazy? Because what it's helped us do is to recreate that sense of community in a, very, uh, in a world in which we are geographically separate and we don't have a lot of time. So Facebook and the other forms of social media allow you to, to, to rebuild those communities. And in that sense, they're actually, I'd say, very, very positive. Right? But there's a, there's a but, which is the second part of relationship that's really important from all the research and the positive psychology is what they call, you might call, authentic intimacy. And as well as having 300 Facebook friends, <laughs> to actually be well and to be happy and to live a long, healthy life, you actually need to have, and the research is, keeps coming down to, three to seven, three to seven intimate friends with whom you have an authentic relationship. And by the way, over half of them are usually family members, for better or worse, family members. So there's something about this, this intimacy, and of course the thing you worry about if you have kids who are all, all the time on the internet, you worry about that sort of natural, authentic, sort of uh, you know, intimacy that's going on. When I, was, when I was, had cancer, I was 30, and I had a group of young friends, and they were all sort of young Turks. Uh, you know, we were sort of like little young bulls in a paddock, and, and I got cancer, and I was dying, and they came with me to the chemotherapy one after another, and we'd have these conversations about fears and hopes and things that you know, young men at 30 just my day didn't have. And of course, then I got better, and we had this problem. Because, uh, you know, we had all these conversations assuming I was going to die and, you know, da da da. And, and I knew about everybody. I knew everything, right? But what happened was we couldn't go back, but we didn't know how to go forward. And one of my friends said, Look, I've heard about this guy who runs these men, men's groups. This was 20 years ago, right? And I said, Well, what, what is he doing? He says, I don't know. Let's go and try it. But, it, you know, so we went off, seven of us, and we sat in a circle for the weekend out in the bush. And basically, the idea was, this facilitator gave us a stick. Whoever had the stick talked and everyone else listened. And before he started, he said these words. He said, do you love yourself enough to tell the truth? Ooh, I can remember the time. I was like, oh. So here we were, a young group of men, and we'd have these incredible conversations. We'd just talk. One of us would talk, everyone would listen, and we'd all get to comment on it. And it was actually a, a, a course in emotional in, you know, intimacy, and it's changed my life. I can, I can say that. It's, it's changed my life. And of course, we'd go back to our wives and our girlfriends and they'd say, what do you, what do, you do on these sort of men's weekend things? And, and we'd say, you know, do you beat drums and da 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 And so no, actually, we just sit in a circle and we sort of talk and we talk honestly about what's going on. Not to have a solution, but just to talk about our fears and hopes. And they'd say, well, that's what I do with my girlfriends over coffee every, you know, every Thursday afternoon. What's so special about that? But of course, for men, it is special. Right? It is special to have those sort of conversations. And so this, this idea of when I, when I talk about these relationships, I'm really talking about uh, you know, authentic intimacy, right? really close relationships where there's a, there's a level of honesty and connection that allows you to be seen and sort of see others. And from the research, this, this is very compelling and very compelling in health. Right? So if you, just one, just one item from the research, if you ask a heart patient two questions, does your do you have a, a partner who loves you? Do you have family or close friends who love you? And if they answer yes to both those questions, their life expectancy is doubled. It's doubled. Right? It's just doubled. It's as simple as that. So feeling like you're in a loving environment where there's love around you and support essentially doubles our life expectancy in these sort of situations. Right? Now, the final thing that comes from all the research is about meaning. The final thing that makes for great lives is actually purpose and meaning. And people that have a purpose or meaning actually uh, live longer and live happier, happier lives, right? Uh, and uh, that purpose or meaning is, is something beyond yourself. It's, it's a service. It's, it, it's helping others. It's a, it's a reason for living beyond yourself. And if you have kids, then it, that becomes a big part of it, right? Uh, Viktor Frankl did a lot of studies during the, co in the concentration camps, and some of you may have heard these stories, right? And he studied not the Viktor who was here yesterday, but another Viktor who was... Um, lived in the Second World War, and he 
he was a doctor, he tried to understand who survives in the concentration camps, who survives. Right? And who survived was not the physically strongest people, not the mentally strongest people, it was the people that had a reason to live. It was the people that had a meaning or a purpose to live. Right? And, uh, and the interesting thing about life is that life is meaningless. And we give life meaning. Right? And you have to constantly re-engage and sort of regenerate your meaning. So if that's what makes a great life, how does super connectivity work into all that? Well, it works into that in terms of helping us build community. It works in, in terms of the sort of stimulation and the intellectual, but it can also be overwhelming. And super connectivity can be overwhelming. How do you deal with all the information? So it's a plus and a minus on that account. But the big area where it, where it has a weakness is, is around this uh, area of authentic intimacy. And I, I would venture to say that if a world of super connectivity without authentic intimacy is actually a world of isolation. Right? It's, a, it's an isolated world. And you see that today. I'll give you one example. They've done studies of people who are big Facebook users. And big Facebook users in these studies, some of them have lower self-esteem than others who don't use Facebook a lot. Do you know why? Because they go on Facebook and they see all their friends' five best photos of the 200, airbrushed a bit in some cases. They uh, see the story of the great party that, that they went to and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's like this airbrushed selective life. And so you look at my life and you think, well, I'm ugly and I'm basically uh, boring. And so you end up with this effect. What's going on here? These Facebook lives that people are presenting are not authentic lives. They're, they're an aspect of their life. They're sort of like, a, this is the life I'd like to present as opposed to who I am. Right? So there's something about how we, you know, are we able in this world of super connectivity uh, to actually also deepen the uh, authentic intimacy, because if we're not, we actually end up with a lot of isolation. And you can, you can see that happening, right? So let me just say that there are some technologies of authentic intimacy, in the same way there are of, um, of uh, the super connectivity externally. One of those is about the heart. And uh, intim intimacy is actually a heart thing, not a, not a head thing. Right? And uh, those of you who, who may not know this, the heart actually thinks and feels. And it thinks and feels uh, as much, sometimes even more than the head. And for those who are interested in this, there's a couple of great books I can recommend. One is by a fellow called Paul Pearsall. And Paul Pearsall uh, was a fellow who studied, he was a heart surgeon, who realised that about 20% of his patients who got a new heart took on the characteristics of the person who had the heart before them. Like... One great example in the book, it's fantastic, it's called The Heart's Code, is a, is a, a mid-Western pious woman who got the heart of a biker and started loving beer and pizza and all sorts of other things that are in the book, you'll see, it's incredible. And uh, she was shocked and they're just incredible stories, but not everybody takes on these characteristics, 20% do, and the 20% who do actually are people who we'd call heartful. They're people who actually listen to the heart, so the heart actually communicates to the head. There's another great book called The Hearts, uh, called, it's called Heart Math by Doc Childray. Those of you who've seen that, which talks all about the research on the physiology of heart brain connection. So, this, this idea of actually the heart and how the heart communicates uh, is a technology that we should be putting as much effort and energy into as we are this sort of external super connectivity. We're not, we're not yet. There's little, little bits of research happening here and there around the world. But in, until we do, we're actually going to end up with sort of over-emphasis on, on this side of the equation. Uh, so just to give you a personal experience of this whole idea of heart connection, uh, I, I actually spent time uh, with a teacher who, who said to me, I, I, I grew up in a family out back of Western Australia where mum would have an emotion in the kitchen and everyone would run, you know, out. Mum's having an emotion in the kitchen. Oh, quick, let's get out of here. <laughs> and, uh, and so to say I had a closed heart was, was a sort of understatement. But... And then this, this uh, teacher of mine said to me, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, give you a couple of practices. And the practice is essentially that you go into your heart and you sit quietly in your heart. I'd like you just to sort of do it with me now for a moment. So just sit, sit quietly. It's like a form of meditation. And you just close your eyes, just rest, and imagine that your, your awareness is in your heart. And actually, as you breathe, imagine that you're breathing in and out of your heart. Just very gently 
Just imagine that your breath is actually physically coming in and out of your heart. Now imagine something very wonderful in your life, very loving, a loving moment. And as you breathe in, just imagine breathing in that wonderful, loving moment into your heart. Maybe it's a face of a child that you love. Maybe it's a joyful moment that you've had. Just breathe it in through your heart. Now take that feeling and just, as you breathe it in, feel it going into your whole body. Just breathe it up into your arms and down into your legs and just breathe it out. Okay, just gently bring yourself back and open your eyes. So that, that little practice, she said to me, just keep doing it. And I kept doing it, nothing much happened for a while. And then after a couple of weeks, I, I started to feel like someone was sort of like these rashes, someone was ripping my heart open. And, uh, and then after about three months of doing this, I walked down the street and I saw a mother and a baby and I just started crying. And I've been hopeless ever since. Um, <laughs> I, I cried about five times last night during the dinner and, uh, and I, I cried during Telstra ads and all sorts of things. And <laughs> what, what physiologically happened is my, my heart opened actually and uh, my heart opened and it's changed my ability to be in authentic, intimate communication. It's changed my life. But for those of you interested, there, there's some wonderful practices just around opening the heart and actually connecting it with the mind which are life-changingly powerful in terms of relationships and, and ability to actually have a long, healthy and happy life. So what I want to leave you with as you head home over, over, over the weekend is I'm sure you've had a wonderful couple of days. The adult learning says you should only take one or two ideas away because if you try to take a hundred, you'll never do anything with them. So just think of the one or two that will make the biggest difference. I'd really encourage you to definitely when you leave check your BlackBerry and update your Facebook. But I'd also really encourage you to actually think about your heart. And when you, when you get home, take, take a moment just to spend time with someone that you really love. Because from all the research, and certainly from my experience, that, that's what makes for a great and meaningful life. Because I can tell you, having been to my deathbed once when I was 30, and Ian Gawler got us to do this little deathbed meditation, he called it, where you sit quietly, and you imagine you're on your deathbed, who's there, what matters. There were, the people that were there were the people you loved. You didn't, all the rest of it, it wasn't there. And then the other thing that was there was did I have the courage to live my life and make a difference to the things that I cared about. The, the, and there were 30 of us in the room, we're all different, and we all, we all had the same thing. It's love given and received, uh, and it's actually uh, having the courage to, to make a difference and help others. And they, they were the things that you, I, I, I carried on my deathbed. So with that, uh, I wish you all the very best. Hope you've had a wonderful uh, conference and uh, look forward to uh, any of the, the questions uh, that you have. Thank you.